Well, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it's pretty good. Listen, you can't beat seeing kids on stage. You don't even need to hear me after that. That was awesome. So, it's great. I don't know who that was. But I want two of you to go. All right, so, um, it's, uh, no, I mean, like, hang out with me all the time. It's good. Um, today we're going to talk about your ministry of mercy. And here's the key verse for today. Matthew 5, 7 says this. Blessed are, or if you're King James Christian, blessed. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now this word bless is a really cool Greek word. It's, it would translate literally into the idea of happy. The problem is our view of happy isn't really right. So, you know, the Christian life isn't really meant for you to be happy like, hey, all of that. But it's the idea of having a heart that is so full and so blessed that you're filled with joy even when life is tough, even when life is difficult, even when things don't go the way you want them to go. When you go out of your way to be merciful to others, God blesses you. Now, let me just kind of give you just a simple definition uh, of the idea of mercy with compassion. Mercy with compassion is love in action. So when you not only receive God's mercy and you realize that God, what God has withheld from you, and then you understand his grace, what he's given you, then what you begin to do is you begin to be merciful with other people. But can I tell you something about this? When people think about Christians, just like that little commercial just said, when people think about Christians, they think of judgmental. They think of critical. They think of people who complain all the time. And you know why? Because we do. We have to be careful that we really are living the Christian life and understanding what God has done for us. Because here's what happens. If you don't understand God's mercy, then you think that God has a list. And you think that he's comparing you to somebody else next to you. And so you feel like you always have to put someone else down. You have to be a little superior to them. You constantly go around pointing out everybody else's flaws and what they did wrong and how they did. So that you can feel like, well, if that person's a little less than me, then maybe God will accept me. Understanding mercy helps you and I to understand that because of the blood of Jesus, because Jesus died for us, we are completely forgiven. And because of that, because of his forgiveness and because of his mercy on us, we can then have mercy on other people. Now, here's what I want you to know. God not only can, but will use you. To bring mercy to other people. If you'll let him. No matter what you're going through right now. And I will tell you something. Sometimes on your very worst day. When life is going bad. It's easy to say. I can't do things for other people. I'm just dealing with my own stuff. Let me tell you something. One of the best times you can show mercy to someone else. Is when you are going through a difficult time. Because what happens is when you and I go through difficulties, many times we become more selfish. We become less patient. We become more self-centered. And yet if we look to the needs of other people, it will actually help us through difficult times. That's why Jesus said you're blessed. Because when you receive God's mercy, you begin to realize, I've received God's mercy. I can be a blessing to somebody else. I can now give someone grace because I've been given God's mercy and been given grace. And here's what's awesome about mercy. You're never too old to give mercy. You're not too young to give mercy. Little kids making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You don't have to have money to give mercy. You don't have to be smart to give mercy, which many of you today say... Eric, that's why we come here to church, because you make us feel brilliant. By the way, I did have somebody say that yesterday. You make me feel so good about myself. Are you saying because I'm such an idiot? Is that what that... They didn't nod, but I knew what they meant. Do you know you don't need a degree to give mercy to somebody? To show someone God's love? To show them His grace? 
But you have to be humble. If you right now are thinking, you know, God could really use me. This church doesn't know what I can do for them if they only knew. <laughs> You're the person God won't use. If you want God to use you, it's not about being perfect. It's not about having everything together. It's not about, you ready for this? Not having a past. Some of you have done some dumb things. We've talked to each other. You've told me. Some of you I talk to and I go, you know, I felt really dumb until I talked to you. Now I feel brilliant, right? No matter what you've done, you can still give mercy to other people. But sometimes we don't because we forget and we get busy and life gets complicated. So today what I want to look at is I want to look at one of my favorite stories. And early on when this church began, this was one of the first stories that I remember thinking, that's the kind of church that Surfside needs to be. A church that doesn't kick the wounded, a church that doesn't beat up the wounded, but a church that looks for ways to carry the hurting. We're going to talk about the steps of mercy, and it's in a story that's in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, and one of my favorite stories when it comes to ministry. So here's a few steps. Number one, we bring others to Jesus together. We bring others to Jesus together. Mark 2, verse 1 through 3. A few days later, buckle up, here we go. A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. So Jesus was teaching the Bible. And then it says, some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Carried by four of them. Let me, let me tell you a couple things about this. First of all, you need to know that you can accomplish more with other people than you can by yourself. But let me also tell you, when you work with other people, it's a pain. Isn't it easier to do things by yourself? Because when you're by yourself, you are always right. When you're by yourself, no one else is wrong. Because there is no one else. You're by yourself. But the problem is you could not have carried this man by yourself. Do you realize there were four? So you know that one of these people was slow. You ever walk with somebody? You ever go walk with somebody and you figure out real quick if they're a speed walker or a lolly, lollygagger, right? So you're walking and you say, hey, you want to go for a walk? Yeah, let's, let's go. Let's walk. Down. I had a friend. But we used to go to lunch and we walked down in uh, uh, Cocoa Village. And he would leave me. He would, I think he would have been, I have felt like I was jogging to lunch with him. And, and we would go to lunch and he was, Whoa. and now I got little bitty legs. So I, I'm just doing my best to keep up with him. But then there's other people, and most of you have children that are this way, especially when you want them to do something important. Are you coming? So you know that those four men care. One of them had to be a little slow, and one of them had to be the speed walker of the group. And you know what they had to do? They had to get along. In order to make a difference, they had to lean and bend towards the needs of each other. You cannot work in a group without putting down and letting go of some of your preferences. I'm going to tell you a secret. Neil, cover your ears. I don't like every song we sing. I'm not saying I don't like any song we sing, but sometimes we sing a song and I think, I, I don't want to sing that again. Do we have to sing that again? Did you know that I don't stand up here on Sunday and go, I just want you all to know song three I didn't like today. But did you know in churches all over America today, there are people that right now hear a song they don't like and they sit down during church. I was at a church that every time they sang anything that wasn't a hymn, the older people in the church would sit down to protest publicly that they didn't like these new songs. Can I tell you something about those people? They're all dead now. But some of them passed it on to some of the younger people, and that church till this day is still dying and still doesn't reach out to unchurched people. Why? Because all they care about is their preferences. If all you care about and if all we care about as a church is our preferences, we will never be able to carry anyone to Jesus. There's going to be things you don't like if you hang around with other people. 
there's going to be things you don't like in this church. If you get to know me, I guarantee you there's a few things you won't like about me. Hey, and can I tell you a secret? Well, we'll get there. I'll tell you that secret in a minute. They wanted to bring their friend to Jesus because they knew that's what he needed. We have a lady that's coming here to church that several years ago, here's what she said to me. She said, I was praying God told me to come to this church. And then she said this, not the pastor. She said, but I don't want to be here. This is not my style of church. Okay, good to have you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> now I will let you know she's never complained. She's never made a big deal. Now she'll tell me, but she's never, it's not her thing. This is, she likes pews and she likes organs and she likes stained glass. And she's like, what am I doing here? But she felt like God said, you need to be here. In the last three months, all of her children, all of her grandchildren, and all of her great-grandchildren have been coming here to church. Every single one of them has been coming. She came to me and she said, I know why I'm coming here to church. The only way that happens is if you humble yourself and you say, God, you know what? I'm willing to bend towards other people no matter where I'm at. And can I tell you something else? One of those four people was busy that day. They did not have time. Too often in life, we communicate to other people that they're not important because we're busy. And sometimes we're too busy watching a football game. Sometimes we're too busy making dinner. By the way, if you're so busy making dinner that you get mad at your family, you forgot the purpose of making dinner. If you're so busy trying to get to church that you're fighting with the people in the car. <clears throat> By the way, I think the enemy attacks people the worst on Sunday mornings. I, one of those guys might have been a, a wineaholic back then. He, he might have struggled with alcohol. We don't know. Do you know why we don't know the backgrounds of all four of these people? Because it doesn't matter. God does not check your ID before he says he can use you. God never says, well, let me see what your credentials are. He just says, are you humble? Do you want to allow me to use you? Number two, we focus on Christ to overcome challenges. If you do ministry, if you minister to other people, you will have challenges. But it is easy to get distracted. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are easily distracted? How many of you didn't hear me because you're distracted? Okay, all right. Some of you didn't raise your hand. I'm like, you just didn't even hear me. You were thinking about pizza. All right. And some of you, when I said pizza, just thought of pizza, thought of a good pizza place and where you have a coupon. All right. So I understand. But... If you're going to do ministry, and here's the deal, you're all called to ministry. What? You are a minister. What? You may not be a pastor. I don't know why I said it that way. A pastor. But you're called to ministry. God has put you in your neighborhood, with your family, where you work, the people you come in contact with, for you to do ministry. When you're standing in line at Publix, are you thinking, I'm a minister? Or are you thinking, get me out of here, away from people? Jesus never made people feel like they were in his way. There's only two commands, love God and love people. It doesn't say anything about being in a hurry and getting your checklist done. And yet as Americans, we've traded checklists for people. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd. By the way, everything in your life is going to try to crowd out Jesus. Everything in your life is going to try to keep you from caring about the people in your life. You're going to be so busy that you will communicate to your children that they are in your way rather than they are your most precious possession. You will communicate to your spouse you're in the way rather than you are a precious possession. You'll communicate to that person in line that they're in the way rather than you're God's precious possession. Possession, And you know what happens when you realize people are God's precious possession? When they have 12 items in the 10 item lane, instead of giving them justice, you give them mercy. Because you've gotten in the 10 item lane before and went, oops. Or you grab that gum and it pushes you over to 11. <laughs> they made, so because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Can I tell you that those four men could have walked up and said, well, we did our best. We're going to take you back home now. I mean, they did a lot of work, but they didn't, wouldn't have quite done enough. By the way, I wonder how many people actually did that. 
How many that day actually were carried somebody to Jesus and said, it's too difficult, we're going back home? Some of you have given up too easy. God wants to use you, but every time you come across a difficulty, you say, well, it's too difficult. I'm not having the result I want. I give up. You've been going out of your way to love somebody and care about them, and before you have a breakthrough, you say it's too difficult. They don't appreciate it. That doesn't matter, and you quit. I can tell you that week after week and month after month, people show up for churches all over the country, and they start helping in a ministry because God told them to, and something goes wrong. They come in contact with other people, and those other people are doofuses. I'll never forget, we had somebody start a ministry years ago, uh, and they wanted to help. And so they said, how can I help? And we said, you can pass out bulletins. So they stood at the front door passing out bulletins. Somebody came to them one week and said, can you close the door because it's hot today and we want to leave the air in. The person threw down the bulletins and said, I will never serve here again. I can't believe these people don't appreciate what I'm doing. What? As crazy as that sounds, why don't you minister? Because when you help people, sometimes you suffer, and sometimes you struggle, but you still keep digging. Number three, we walk in faith to bless others. I love this. When Jesus saw their faith. Here's what's cool about our church. Do you realize God can use your faith to help somebody who walks in the door that you never knew? There would be nothing on this stage this morning if somebody didn't have faith that God was going to do something today and set all this stuff up before the pastor even showed up this morning. There are people that, that run PowerPoint and work with kids and go out of their way to help other people. Why? Because they're walking in faith to saying, how can I be a blessing to other people? They may never see the results, but they go out of their way. Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. It doesn't even say if the man had faith. But his friends had faith. Now, they could have complained. Oh. But can you imagine being Jesus? I want you to think about this. Imagine the homeowner is sitting in front of Jesus. And Jesus is teaching. And all of a sudden there's an interruption of a roof falling on their heads. Now I don't know about you, but I don't like interruptions. I tend to respond to interruptions negatively. And last night, while I was on that point, a phone began ringing in church. To which I said, answer it. Okay. It might be God. We might need to hear what he said. Anyway, but, but yeah, tell her to be quiet. All right. Now, here's something awesome. Last week, we, we had only given away, I think, 20-something boxes. Of course, we had the hurricane off. Last week, we set out a challenge, and we said, hey, we want to see 100 people take boxes. Because the week before, I talked to Peggy, who's in charge of the boxes, and she saw a video where a kid got a toothbrush and lost his mind. Like he had gotten a million dollars. Why? She found out that in that community, some families were so poor they shared a toothbrush. I'm guessing when that kid got his toothbrush, he said, oh, just my brothers and I now, right? And she, she got that faith and said, hey, I really want to see God do something. And then what happened? Last week we made an announcement, hey, we want to go out of our way to bless these children. And you know what you guys did? You picked up that faith and you said, if I fill this shoebox, maybe, just maybe, God will use it. And let me tell you something really cool. Let me give you the end of the story. You don't know where that's going to go. They're going to put brochures in there. You may one day be in heaven, walking across heaven, and all of a sudden this kid from Africa or this kid from India or this kid from Guatemala uh, walks up to you and says, Hey, do you remember that box you sent? And you'll do what I would do. Uh, what? Box. <laughs> right? Because once Christmas is over, you'll forget you ever did it, right? Hey, I read about Jesus and I gave my life to him because of the box you sent. You never know the result of what you do. What has God called you to do? Anything, Steve Brown says, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. Some of you just lost your mind when I said that. Engineers in here went, whoa, until you learn to do it well. Too many people say, when I get good enough, then I'll do it. Can I tell you right now, my first sermon was worse than these. <laughs> my first sermon was about seven minutes long. It was mostly senior adults, and I talked so fast that I don't even know what I said. I talked about microwave Christianity, but I talked about this fast, and I don't even think anybody can understand anything I said. And I finished the sermon, I was done, I sat out. And it was seven minutes. It was a 30-minute message in seven minutes. One of the older men came up to me, and I, he said, I, I, Listen, I have no idea what you said, but you were so compassionate, you just inspired me today. 
don't wait to be perfect for God to use you. You will never be used. God has given you his righteousness so that even in your brokenness, he can use you. Now, here's how mercy helps me to minister to others. Number one, God fills me with compassion for the hurting. When's the last time your heart broke for somebody who was hurting? A homeless person? We live in a world that is continually striving to make us grow cold. As we watch the news, they are propagating anger and hatred and division, and don't let them do it. Did you know that if you're a Democrat, you can love a Republican? And if you're a Republican, you can love a Democrat? And if you're an independent, you can smoke pot? Did you know that all of that... Oh, wait, did I say that last one? Did you know that regardless of your beliefs, you should not hate other people? Hello? Regardless of their beliefs, you should not hate them. You don't have to agree with them to love them. Jesus went all around and did not agree with people, and he loved them. And you know how you could tell? By how he spoke to them. He spoke with respect. When you disrespect people, you're not showing them love. I don't care how right you think you are. When you're right in anger, you're wrong. You ever get mad about something, and you were right in what you said, but you did it the wrong way? You've never done that, right? A leper came to him, begging him and falling on his knees before him, saying, If you're willing, you can make me clean. I love this. Moved with compassion. He felt his suffering. Moved with compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. By the way, you did not touch lepers at that time. You know what the Pharisees were doing while Jesus was reaching out to him? They were over in the corner, and here's what they were saying. This was their conversation. This is true. This is true. Absolutely true. Hey, do you think it's his sin or his parents' sin? They weren't concerned about him. They were concerned about being right and showing that they had it all together. Now, as much as that sounds like how dare those Pharisees, we do it all the time. We're so convinced that we're right that we quit caring about people and we care about our opinions. When you and I care more about our opinions than we care about people, we have missed Jesus' mercy. Jesus could have said to him, tell me about your life. What mistakes have you made? What did Jesus do? He reached out and he gave him compassion. I'm sure it wasn't convenient. Jesus was busy. I'm sure there's times where our own family members feel like they're in the way when we're doing something that won't matter 15 minutes from now, much less in eternity. If you listen to somebody, you might change their life today. But you have to have compassion for them. We more worry more today about our to-do list than building people up. When people came to Jesus, you know what they sensed from him? Love and compassion. Even when roof parts were falling on his head. Even when they brought little screaming children to him, they felt compassion. Now, I'm not talking about enabling people. I'm not talking about giving an alcoholic vodka or even money. But I'm talking about, do you, have to, do you care? Compassionate is the idea of entering into someone else's pain. The idea of compassionate is the idea of not just caring, but entering in. Can you empathize with them? Not just sympathize, can you empathize? Can you feel what they feel? Do you ever look at a homeless person and say, I wonder what their life was like? I wonder how they ended up here. Number two, when I walk in mercy, others find healing. Now, let me tell you something awesome. We've got small groups meeting right now. They're getting ready. Many of them are doing mercy projects. Our group is getting ready to go help at the Boys and Girls Club. Other groups are collecting food. But in the last month, I just want to tell you a couple things that I've seen. We had people from our church, all over our church. Some helped tarp roofs. We had a senior adult lady whose daughter just got out of the hospital with cancer, had a bad prognosis, but her roof was leaking. She didn't have time to mess with it. And I couldn't go over there. I called two people from our church. They were there that afternoon with a tarp on the roof, climbing up there, putting that and covering their roof. Why? Because they had compassion on her and her family. This month, without you even knowing it, you helped put a single mom who was dealing with an abusive situation to take her child and escape to a hotel room. You paid for that. You went out of your way to be a blessing to other people. This week, some of our ladies have been taking plastic bags and putting them together. I don't know if you knit them. I don't know how you do it. I'm doing this, but it's probably not this. It looks like I'm, this is from playing drums. I don't know what I'm doing. But you take the, 
You take the bags and you, they're crocheting them. They put them together so that homeless people can sleep on them. They're waterproof and they're carryable and basically they're free other than all the labor of love. It is intensive and yet our ladies are putting these together so that we can give them to homeless people. They're making hats that go to sailors. They're making booties that go to little babies and little blankets. And there are people of all ages going out of their way to show mercy. Are you showing mercy? Because when you do, you help others find healing. Not just you, but other people. Here's what happened in verse 42. The leprosy left him immediately. He was cleansed. Completely healed and restored to health. And Jesus, once again, deeply moved, admonished him sternly and sent him away immediately saying, See that you don't tell anyone about this, but go show yourself to the priest and offer your purification, what Moses commanded, as proof to them that you were healed. So Jesus says, hey, here's what I'm doing for you. Here's what you need to do. I need you to not tell a bunch of people because if you do, I won't even be able to travel in town. Number three, when I minister for Christ, excuse me, I minister for Christ and not the response. When you do something for Christ, you will not always get the response you want. One of my earliest messages was at a skating rink for a New Year's Eve service. Can I tell you those kids could have cared less? I could have left that night and said, I will never preach or teach again. But I just said, God, if you want me to teach at a skating rink with kids who aren't paying any attention, that's what I'll do. Are you willing to do whatever God wants you to do regardless of the response to you? Are you willing to teach one person if that's the only response you get? But he went out, the man with leprosy, and began to proclaim it freely. He did exactly the opposite of what Jesus told him to do. And he spread the news of his healing to such an extent Jesus could no longer openly enter a city, but stayed out in the unpopulated places, yet people were still coming to him. Listen, when you help people sometimes, you will help people out of a ditch, and they'll get back in the ditch. Now, and I tell this story all the time, and I'm going to tell it again, because not because I'm bitter, I'm really not bitter, but I think it's an important story because you dealt with it. I've had people tell me, Eric, that's why I don't carry jumper cables in my car. One Sunday after church, I went and helped some folks. I jumped. They said, I, I, we can't start our car. Can you give us a jump start? I gave them a jump start. They got home. Three days later, they called the church and said, Eric, you owe us a battery. You blew up our battery. I bought them a battery. Well, Eric, are you crazy? You bought them a battery? Yeah. I bought them a battery. And I still have jumper cables in my car. If you need a jump start today, I'll help you. If I blow up your battery, I'll buy you another one. If God wants you to do something, sometimes the people don't respond the way you want them to. That's not your job. You might do what God wants you to do, and you might suffer for it. Oh, poor baby. You ever compare what we suffer with? Uh, listen, tomorrow there's going to be pastors all over the country that are going to get mean notes. They'll get mean emails, mean Facebook notes, and, and they'll read it and they'll go, Oh, that member doesn't like me. I probably need to leave ministry. These people don't love me. And we're going to get to heaven one day. And some Roman dude's going to come up and say, So, Pastor Eric, what was the hardest thing you ever dealt with? Well, you know, I pastored a church. And that church didn't appreciate me at all. By the way, that's not true here. But, but that church didn't appreciate me at all. They sent anonymous notes. And that's happening all over the country right now, by the way. And it was so mean and blah, blah, blah. And, oh, so I quit ministry. I went and did something easier. I became a salesperson because I just didn't want to do that anymore and deal with those mean people. I began working at Walmart where everyone was nice. No. <laughs> By the way, you Walmart people have it bad. I'm sorry. I love you though. Or I began doing something where I didn't have to work with people. And then I say to the Roman guy, so what happened to you? Oh, my family and I were fed to lions for telling people about Jesus. Oh, my letter doesn't seem very important now. People quit ministry and ministering to people every day because of little things that happen. And the enemy wants to convince you to quit over the dumbest thing. Don't quit. You say, God, if you want me to do this, regardless of how everybody treats me and how they respond and whether or not I have any fruit, I'm going to continue to do what you want me to do. And let me tell you a story. In 1912, there was a guy who had a degree, a, a pharmacy. He worked at a pharmacy. And he felt like God called him. His name was Dr. William Les Leslie. And he was called to a remote part of the Congo where there was still cannibalism. 
And he went there and he began preaching and teaching. And he went to the local tribes, some of who were still cannibals. And he began uh, uh, setting up churches and setting up schools. And he began preaching to the people. 17 years later, he was kicked out by the tribal leaders. They would not allow him into town. So he came home, felt defeated, felt like a failure. Just a few years later, he died. Something of depression. Just about four years ago, a group of missionaries went back to that area. They, they had to fly into a remote area and then hike into there. As they hiked into there, they found 34, a 34-mile 34 area where every tribe was Christian. They found a 34-mile area which had so many Christians that they had sing-offs between, between their choirs. They found a, a stone uh, uh, church that held over 1,000 people. In that area. And when they asked the people who brought the gospel, they did not know the guy's name, but they described this missionary. And he thought he died of failure. You may not feel like you're getting any result from what God's told you to do, but be faithful, giving mercy to other people. God can use anyone to give mercy. He can use you to minister, but minister where he's placed you. It doesn't have to be big. It might be peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It might be an email or a text. I want to encourage all of you to do this today. This is the easiest ministry you can do today. When you leave here, you're on your way. Go out in the, but you can't get a signal in here. I tell you to do it right now, but go out front. And as you go, I want you to say, God, show me someone who I can send a note of encouragement to. Maybe it's somebody you haven't seen in a while. And you just send him a note and say, hey, so-and-so, I was, don't call him so-and-so, I was thinking about you today. I just want you to know, I thought about you during church today, and I want you to know I love you. You might change the course of somebody's life with that one note. They might ask you, where'd you go to church today? That's not like you to do. Now, here's some questions about what I'm willing to do. I'm going to do these real quick. Am I ministering for Christ or myself? You know when you find that out? When things don't go well. Anybody can minister when it's easy, when everybody goes, oh, that was Eric, that was the best sermon. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's hard on the days they fire you. Almost every pastor I know at some point in ministry has been fired unjustly. Did you know that? Start asking questions. You'll find it out. They'll tell you. They'll try not to act bitter. Do you keep doing what God wants you to do even when the results aren't good? Are you going to continue to love on your spouse when they don't love you back? Are you going to continue to show love to your children as they're teenagers? Do I need to say any more? <laughs> Am I willing to face opposition? What gifts do I have? Hey, you know how you find out your gifts? Try it. Try it. I went to this art thing and I thought, you know, maybe I haven't done art in a long time. Maybe I could do this. Before we left, the lady said, well, it's a good thing you're good at preaching. <laughs> So next time we have one of these art things at church, I will take pictures and not draw pictures, okay? That will be my... Am I sacrificed? Am I doing without anything to show mercy? You know, one of the worst things in, in American churches that foreigners don't understand is that we don't sacrifice anything. Have you sacrificed any time? Have you ever missed a football game to go out of your way to bring soup to somebody? Oh, Which God are we worshiping? Have you ever sacrificed money to help somebody? Gave up going out to dinner or whatever is on your list. Who am I partnering with to show mercy? When you partner with people, it's hard. And then finally, who can I show mercy to this week? God wants to use you no matter what your background, no matter what your past. Ask him, use me to bring mercy. And I will tell you, especially if you're going through a hard time, when Jesus said, you'll be blessed, you'll be blessed. You may not want to do it. You may not want to reach out, but when you do it, you'll be blessed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your mercy on us. Lord, I pray if anyone in here today or anyone watching online doesn't know you, that today they would surrender their life to you, knowing that you died for their sins, that you rose again so that we could have victory in you, so that we could receive your mercy and walk in it. Father, I pray today they would give their lives to you before they leave here. Father, I pray also for us as Christians. So often we get our eyes focused on ourselves and our selfishness and our self-centeredness. And we forget what you've done for us. So, Father, forgive us for that. And, Lord, help us to walk in your mercy this week to show compassion to others. 
Father, I pray as a church, thank you for all you've done in these last few months especially. But Father, may it continue. I know when we do what's right, the enemy attacks. So we pray that in the middle of those times that we would know your grace. And Father, that we would receive your presence, that you would guard us from the enemy and the things he does. And Father, for that one who's given up today because they faced opposition, I want to pray that you would give them a new start. Lord, that they would go back and try again to love, try again to encourage, try again to bless, and know that they'll be blessed. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you give today, know that some of what you give, a lot of what you give, uh, goes all over the world to help people. People right now are being helped in other countries because you've given. So you give today and know that God's mercy is being used through you. Thank you.